Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And those of you that uh, caught the message on Facebook, I mentioned to you that we would be looking at a message in the book of Numbers today, uh, something I was working on and wanted to speak to you about. And I have to just, uh, one thing I want to share with you, I haven't been making as many videos here, here recently. And uh, part is due because of the travels and, and getting over to uh, the United States, which we thank you for your kindness and helping us to do that. And of course, in about three weeks from now, we'll be headed back uh, to, uh, to Europe, to Israel, working in both between Europe and Israel. But, uh, but another reason is, is because my heart has been very heavy. I've been studying in the Word of God and the more that I study, the more that I realize that we are living in an hour, in a time where the people are not ready. The people are not ready for the coming of the Lord. And I say this, I even, I've had a, a change of heart. I've been working on writing on, on one book about getting the Jewish people to recognize who the Messiah is. And then I have felt impressed to write a book on what type of ministry will the two witnesses actually bring. Because God has dealt with me on this subject so much and revealed to me so much, especially in the identity of the witnesses, but even in the ministry that they will have. And I, I feel impressed to do this because I see I see what already, what's coming. When I, when I say this, I mean, I'm, I'm lost at words almost to try to, to, to share this message with you because one of the things that God shared with me and showed me, and I shared this with you guys many times before, why does he call them witnesses to begin with? Why does he say two witnesses? Why isn't it two Baptists, two Methodists, two Presbyterians? Well, we won't even go down the road of Catholic or anything else, but, or Pentecostal for that matter. Because why? You've denominized in all these different groups and God is not in that. God is in his word. And I've always kind of thought that the two witnesses is to Israel alone, but now I'm beginning to realize they're not just coming for Israel alone. Because why? The church is not ready either. They do come to open the eyes of Israel to get them to recognize who their Messiah was, but they've got to open up the eyes of the Christian church because she's got all these different doctrines going on. You know, uh, and even the simplest things, look at the division, that, the, like for example, the rapture. Is there a rapture or is there not a rapture? Oh, it's pre-trip, it's mid-trip, it's post-trip. What about water baptism? We do it. Matthew 28, 19, we do it. Uh, Acts 2.38, or, 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 or we do it like John did. The doctrines just abound and abound and abound, and, and, and even in the doctrine of the two witnesses. Oh, it's uh, the Old and New Testament. No, it's not that. It's uh, Jim and John over there. Or no, it's John the Baptist is coming back. No, it's John the Revelator. No, it's Enoch and Elijah. No, it's Moses and Elijah, and the argument goes on. Then we have the argument of women should remain silent because Paul said so. Well, we find out, well, the Bible, they didn't translate that right. Oh, what are you kidding me? The Bible's perfect. Then we got the other side, King James. It's got to be King James and nothing else. Do you realize the mix-up that is in Christianity? And understand, I've been right there with you. I'm no different than, than you. I have grown up in my earlier part of, of life. Of course, I've always believed the Torah to be true. I believe that you know, the Torah is the, is the law of Moses. And, and then, of course, as we're, we're an institute of research, so we research the original languages, uh, both in Hebrew and in Greek. And, and my wife, she's, she's not a Greek scholar. She'll tell you she's not a scholar, but she studies it like a scholar would study. She studies in depth. And, of course, she does that with anything. But the point is, is even myself in our studies that we've seen, 
we've seen the, the mistranslations, the, the, the abuse of the scriptures uh, clearly. Uh, we see that continually. But now I'm finding out it's also in the Hebrew as well. And so here we're at an hour where Yeshua is going to return and he's coming for a bride. And the question is, is she ready? Well, you know, the odd thing is Yeshua says himself that when they ask him the question, doesn't the scripture say Elias must first come? And he said, truly, Elias shall, which is a Greek for Elijah, shall first come and restore all things. And we know he says, but I say unto you, he's come already. But notice, he puts it in the future. John's already dead when the question's asked. They come down from Mount Transfiguration. They see Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. And if you notice them behind me, I wasn't even thinking of it, but I didn't do it intentionally like this, but I put the menorah here. My wife said it would be kind of nice for, for, for the biblical teaching. And so, But Christ is that lampstand of Zechariah. And on either side of the golden lampstand stood Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. And then he says to them, because they asked the question, well, I thought Elias was supposed to come. They were looking for the literal Elijah to come. It's not the literal Moses and Elijah that come. And then Yeshua says, truly I say unto you, he shall first come and restore all things. Why has he got to come and restore all things? Because they're a mess. The doctrines that we're dealing with are a mess. Now, we're going to go to num numbers here in just a moment, but I want to, I, want to sh I want to bring back the scripture I brought to you the other day. In Jeremiah, I I'm going to read to you from the King James, and then I'm going to show you where King James didn't translate it right for you. And you have to understand, translators are not prophets, but even prophets get it wrong too, because you're going to find out God calls prophets liars too. There's true prophets, but then there's also false. Elijah was a true prophet of God. Jezebel had 400 well-fed prophets that were all prophesying in one mind, one accord, and believe me, God was not in the majority. God was in the minority. He took the one prophet, Elijah, and his word was true, whereas the 400 were proven to be false. Jeremiah says here, Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, chapter 8, verse 4, by the way, Thus saith the Lord, shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? When then is the people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual black backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as a horse rusheth into, into the battle. It's the same problem in Christianity. Everybody turns to their own course, got their own idea, their own ideology of what's the truth. And if you don't agree with them, you're out. I think we need to start having more compassion on one another. And I think we need to quit condemning and judging every single person because of this guy or that guy or this sister or that sister. There's so many scruples in the church right now, it's not even funny. God said he would have to send Elijah to straighten it out. So he said, everyone go to their own way. Verse 7, Yea, the stork in heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Verse 8, How do you say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. 
Now, if you take this the way the King James Version writes this here, it's as if, making it in layman's terms, that he's saying, how do you say we are wise in the law of the Lord is with us? In other words, we got the law. We, we're Jews. We're the Orthodox Jews. We got the law. The law, is, the, the law is with us. The Lord is with us because we have the law. And he says, lo, certainly in vain made he it. It makes it sound like that, in other words, they're just not living what God wrote. The pen of the scribe is in vain. In other words, it's kind of like the scribe wrote this down for you, but you don't believe it. That's what you get when you read King James. Now, I'm not knocking King James. King James has got a lot of good English translations. Believe me, they do. But there's, there's problems in every one of them. Okay? But let me, let me show you what it really says. Okay? Now, this is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you word for word the way they have the English translation from a Jewish Bible. Okay? But I want to read to you that last part of the verse right there. And I'm going to read to you in Hebrew. He says, Achin hine la shaka o se et shaka safarim. All right? The word, by the way, shaka is a lie. You can translate it as false as well, but it's a lie. It's not vain. It's not vanity. It's not, gosh, he wrote it, but the people just don't believe it. Let me read to you the way even the scholars in Israel translate this to English. And this is from, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this well enough here. Here we go. All right, this is Hebrew English right here. And just so you're able to see that there. All right, let's see. Well, it just, it doesn't say, oh, it's the Bible Society in Israel, Jerusalem. That's on the bottom part there just for you guys. So you can see that. Um, Verse 8 is translated, How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Now that is translated correctly. But watch the second half of the verse. But behold, the lying pen of the scribe has made it unto a lie. I'll, I'm going to translate it for you literally. He says, uh, So behold, a hen Hine, so behold, la shaker, for the lie was made. And the pen made a lying book. Now they know that the pen is, is done by the scribe. That's why they put the word in there for the scribes. So, and it is the right way to translate that would be, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Made what into a lie? Something, Jeremiah is writing in here, something was altered in the Torah by the scribes. These are scribes that are writing in the Hebrew language, writing and recopying the words of the Bible. And Jeremiah says they changed something. Let me tell you something. When Yeshua came in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees were keeping everything that they saw that was written to the letter. But something had been altered. Now, that's the same thing I brought to you not too long ago. And, and you want to get a little idea of what the two witnesses are going to preach? And, and I get a lot, of, a lot of criticism for this. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, come and preach to you any other doctrine than that which I brought to you. Let him be accursed. I'm paraphrasing. Who's the we? In other words, the believers that were among with him. If any believer preached any other doctrine than that what he taught, let him be accursed. And believe me, the people that believe, oh, the woman has to shut her mouth, she's not to speak in the church or anything. And they say, see, Paul said, if, even if an angel try to change that word to be accursed, you're 
the Bible tells you right there that the pen of that scribe, he lied. Just If Jeremiah saw it regarding the law of Moses, imagine what they were going to do to Paul's words. See, Paul saw that. He saw that his words were going to be changed and altered. You'd be surprised what all's been done. Yeshua says that truly Elias shall first come and do what? Restore all things. Well, I, bless God, we just got to have the Bible. That's what we do need. But we need the Bible. We need to know from the original tongue that God wrote it in. Do you know this is why the Dead Sea Scrolls have been hidden? Do you know that the Vatican was given the majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were discovered? They, went in, they were under Vatican control in Israel, in Jerusalem, and for 50 years, they didn't let nothing out. Finally, they started letting little tiny fragments out. I saw a documentary just recently and everything where one of the Jewish brothers there, he got a little fragment from him. Oh, wow, a little tiny little piece, a little chip there. Was all excited about it. Of course, the documentary was done back in the 90s. Now, they've released some other ones. You know why the Vatican won't release any of this? As Gershon Solomon shared with me, my wife was there present as a witness. He shared this with me. He says, because they discovered in those scrolls there that the Catholic Church is a fake and a fraud. And who's the one that put together the Bible in the beginning? Well, in around 325, 350, you know, third, fourth century, we should say, is the Vatican. It was Rome under Constantine. Kind of interesting. He wanted he he brought in all the priests of Mithras to do that. Now let me let me say that when I when I'm saying these things, don't misunderstand me. Salvation lays within this Bible. I don't care if you got a King James, NIV, uh, Jewish, whatever you want to have, the salvation plan is there. To believe on Him, to know that Yeshua is the Son of God and to accept that and to believe upon Him will save any man, woman, child that is willing to accept in Him and to believe that He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But there's coming a time very shortly that God is demanding perfection. Just as when Yeshua came, Yeshua came to do what? To restore the word back to what it should have been. But the Pharisees couldn't handle that. Anyway, let's take, I want to take you to the book of Numbers. Let, let, me, let me read, I read that a little bit to you in, in there. Let me read it to you uh, a little bit more. I'm going to back up to verse 7 in the, in the Jewish, from the Hebrew. Even the historic, uh, wait a minute, verse 6. You know what? I'm going to take you all the way back to the top. Chapter 8. At that time, declares the Lord, they will bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of the princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from their graves. They will spread them upon the sun, the moon, and all the host of heaven which they have loved and which they have served and which they have gone after, which they have sought and which they have worshipped. They will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground and death will will be chosen rather than life by all the remnant that remains on, of, the, of this evil family that remains in all the places to which I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repent? 
Verse 6, I have listened and heard. They have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course like a horse charging into battle. That's what's happening even amongst the Christian people today. I mean, the two witnesses are coming to open the eyes of, 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 of the Jewish people to get the remnant to, see, and I say remnant here, notice, because why? Even when the two witnesses come, not all Israel is going to believe that is there physically now. But there's a remnant that will believe. But you know, I believe that they have to also open the eyes of the Gentiles. And it's not that the Gentiles need their eyes open to recognize who the Messiah is. The Gentiles know that Yeshua was the Messiah. That's not the problem. The Gentiles are hungry to know what the Word of God says. They're sick and tired of all the different doctrinal nonsense that's out there. They're tired of it. Look at the people coming out of the churches. And here's the funny thing. And it's not even funny. I, I don't say it as a humor, as a joke, but let me just say it like this here. Think about how serious this is. All these doctrines that you have been given by uh, these evangelists and these, these ministries, these mega churches and stuff about the Antichrist or the system or the New World Order, whatever they happen to be preaching on about prophecy, they're all running back to mother prostitute Roman Catholic Church. Now, maybe not every single one of them, but the majority of them are. Do you wonder then maybe if, if, God, if God said to Jeremiah that the pen of the scribes were liars because they changed the God's law, what do you think then that these men that are claiming to be ministers that claim to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that come out and tell you some false lie and pervert the word of God and tell you that the Antichrist is some Muslim Mahdi garbage nonsense. He's been preaching to you exactly what Rome wanted him to preach all along. That's why you see him going right back, Jesus says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so do they. Their true colors are coming out. So he says here, even the stork in the sky knows her season, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their, of their migration, but my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord know the ordinance of the Lord. They don't know the ordinance of the Lord. That's what it should be written over here in King James. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord, the ordinance of the Lord, the commandments of God. He says, how can you say we are wise in the law? The Lord is with us. But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. That's why so many ministers preach against women. Oh, they taught you that all right. Oh, they said, Paul said over here that, that woman is... The, 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 the man is the, is the head of, of, of the woman and, and, and Christ is the head of the man and you're to obey and submit yourself. God is the source of Christ. Head in Koine Greek, which is what Paul wrote this in has nothing to do with master. There is another word in Greek for that. If he was your Lord, your master, he would have used the word for that. Because when he talked about the slave, he did talk about him having a master. But she is the, Christ's source is God. And man's source or head, is the way King James translates that, is Christ. Why? Because Christ created all things. He formed that man. And the man is the source of the woman. Why? Because why? God taken from the side of Adam and made her. And many other things we've already gone 
too many, many times before. She shall be safe. Saved in childbearing, says King James. Saved. Can, can, can somebody tell me the logic of that? I'm talking about fundamentalist Bible believing like the Baptists do. Baptists know what? That you are saved because you believe upon Yeshua to be the Son of the living God. So do you think Paul has a right to come and change God's word and say, oh, by the way, no, the women are saved as long as they can have babies. So if you're barren, you go to hell. Think of the logic of this. But when we go to find out the true translation of the Greek word, he didn't say saved. You'll be saved in childbearing. Paul was dealing with the problem of the doctrine of Diana where they believed in the sex orgies and if their husbands didn't go to this goddess of, uh, of Artemis and didn't have this wild party with these perverted things going on, that something bad would happen to his wife and she wouldn't be safe when she had her child. She might die in childbirth. So they served the god Artemis, the goddess Artemis. So what did Paul really say after he got on to this whole thing, after he says, I suffer not that woman to teach, not a woman to teach, but that woman to teach that was doing what? Bringing in the doctrine of Diana, the, god of the, the goddess of Artemis. He said, I suffer not that woman to teach or serve authority. And then he goes on to say, but she shall be safe in childbearing. The lying pen of the scribes. And they did it also in the King James Version and down to, not just King James, I, I don't want to, this ain't just King James that does this. In NIV in in translated it wrong. Uh, many of the other ones translate that wrong as well. For what? For what purpose? You have to understand, the Catholic East Edomites who were worshiping because you've got to remember, Esau is the one that came together with Constantine because he was a descendant of Esau and joined in with Christianity because they saw Christianity was growing, but they wanted their own version of it. But the Edomites were just like the Pharisees. They wanted their women under subjection. Because you know what one of the biggest problems was in Rome when they saw this Christianity moving there? Christians taught the gospel, setting the captives free, that everyone was equal. Didn't know that one. They couldn't have that. So he said, he goes on to say here, after he says about the lying pen, the wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. That's why Rome did it the way they did too. They didn't embrace true Christianity. And I thank God for those that came out of the Catholic Church many years ago and that tried to begin to begin to try to restore, but they still were falling short. This is why Yeshua said to us, Jesus made it clear, he has to send Elias first to restore all things because why? Even these reformers never got it fully right either. I mean, they got away from the Roman Catholic Church. God bless them for that. And it's not to say that the people have not been saved down to the time. God is going to hold you responsible for what you know. But he's coming for a bride. And that bride has to be without spot and has to be without blemish. So he says, they heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace. You know, this is what, this is what the Pope is doing right now to Israel. The daughter of God's people are the Jews that are there. Instead of telling them the truth of what Yeshua really said, they just say, peace, peace, everything will be all right. Don't you worry. We'll control the Arabs. 
Yeah, they control them all right. They tell them when to bomb and when to kill and when to maim the Jews. They tell them to kill each other. You know, the Vatican's been using the Sunnis for a long time. So they had the U.S. create ISIS for them. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? Certainly were not ashamed. And they did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down, says the Lord. I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf will wither. And what I have given them will pass away. Now, keep that in mind. And we're going to conclude with number, from the book of Numbers. I promise you to take you to the book of Numbers. And I think it's very important. Numbers chapter 11. Notice what God's going to do. He's going to take away what he has given. That's interesting. Numbers chapter 11 verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled at the fire. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. That's from the King James. Let me real quick just grab this from the Torah. And uh, so we go to verse 2. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Teborah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And, and by the way, let me just share with you too, as I mentioned to you about Jeremiah, where he says that they'll, they're going to use a lying pen. They're going to they're change the law. I've seen that even in modern times, where the rabbis, when they looked at the prophecy about Moses doing greater wonders than he ever did before, and even going to Israel and was going to bring judgment on the earth because Moses died, they said it couldn't be wonders. God must have been talking about something else. And so they changed the word in there. Now that's a subtle one. I can only imagine what they've changed. The people therefore cried unto Moses, and Moses prayed the Lord, and the fire died out. And the name of that place was called Tebra, because of the fire of the Lord burned among them. The rabble who were among them excuse me, the uh, greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel went again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. I'm, let me read this King James for you guys. That's verse... Uh, yeah, but let me go, we'll go to verse uh, 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? They were lusting. They wanted flesh. Notice what he says. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. That, that may seem simple. That's a lot deeper than what you might realize. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And see, he separated those from the fish. There's a reason for that. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And the manna was a cordner seed and a color, color thereof as the color of uh, bedelium. And the people went about and gathered it on the ground in the mills and beat it in mortar and baked it in the pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep. Throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses also was, dis was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? You 
you know what's really strange? God had already promised to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. They should have made it into Israel in about, what, 10 days, 11 days, uh, two weeks at the most. But because of their lust and their gluttony, they spent 40 years in that wilderness. They hated the manna that God gave them. And yet God was feeding them just like he did in the beginning with Adam and Eve. What's another thing that's interesting in this particular story here, and I'm just going to jump down to it to save time because I've kept you for a long time here. If you go down to verse 14, he says, I am not able to bear this people alone because it is too heavy for me. As Moses is burdened with their constant complaints and moaning and groaning. He says in verse 15, And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them into the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh, for you wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. You notice God doesn't talk anything about the melons. He doesn't say anything about the garlic. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it comes out your nostrils, and it be a loathsome unto you, because that you have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them, or shall the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? Do you realize God didn't want this? This is God's permissive way. And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hands wax short that, th that thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not? And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spake unto him. And he took the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, M Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put this, his spirit upon them. And Moses got him into the camp he and the elders of Israel, and there went forth a wind from the Lord, and he brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on the other side, as it were as a day's journey on the other side, and round about the camp, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just, I want to stop there. Did you notice how Eldad and Medad, Eldad means the Lord's beloved. Medad, it's a similar type of name.
it's, I can't say for sure, but it's almost as if they're a type of the two witnesses because they don't come out to the tabernacle, but they're within the camp. Don't really know. But the one thing I did notice is that God is very well able to take the spirit that is on Moses and put it on another. In this case, he did it with 70. The same thing, by the way, and this is another thing that the children of Israel, my Jewish brethren, you should have recognized this. When Yeshua came on this earth, when God said to Moses, I'll raise up a prophet, He'll raise, the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like it unto me among your brethren. Him shall you hear. And what did he do? Anointed 70 and sent them out and put a portion of his spirit upon them. Friends, the hour is too late. We do not have time to be playing church. We do not have time to be playing games. And if you've got loved ones that do not know Yeshua, let me encourage you today. That's what you need to do is to get people to Christ. Don't worry about trying to get them to all these different doctrines that are all mixed up. When you, when you meet someone and you talk to someone about the Lord Jesus, tell them about Him. If they say to you, where should I go? Say, just go to Christ. And assure them that God is going to straighten out the mess very soon. That's what we should be doing. Get people to Christ. It's a mess. And it's fixing to get to be a greater mess. Because all these churches are joining back up with Rome, the prostitute, the great whore of Revelation. One time, Reverend Hagee would actually say the same. But they had something on him to make him change course. Pray for him. Because I believe that Brother Hagee is a good man. Satan got a hold of him. But there's going to be time for him to repent, just like everyone else, because God will send his two witnesses, and when they come on the scene, it'll be the last opportunity to believe the gospel the way Yeshua brought it. In Matthew 24, Yeshua says that when this gospel is preached into all the world, then the end will come. This gospel, this setting of the captives free, will be the message the two witnesses bring. Not the Baptists, not the Pentecostals, not the Methodists, not the different people that have all the different walks of life and every prophet that has claimed to come along that says that that's the message that's coming. No, sir. When you see the two witnesses come, they will stand up for the captives. That's including setting the gospel straight regarding women. I'm Stephen Benu. Shalom. God bless you and good.